First of all, I'm more, for most of my life, I've been a land mammal. And because I'm a land mammal, I can't really swim. And I've developed this kind of like fear for swimming. And so, what do you do with your fears? You face them head on. So I decided to study lakes. <laughs> I still can't swim, but... <laughs> so, th this led to my research, which is the critical loads of Arctic lakes. A uh, bit of background, as we know, climate change is happening, and the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. And this has led for decreased sea ice, or de decreased sea ice cover, uh, throughout the Arctic, and just last year we've made record lows in terms of sea ice coverage in the Arctic. And this has led to uh, open up the Arctic for marine shipping, specifically along the uh, the Northwest Passage, as you can see here, and along the Hudson Strait, as you can see here. Now, with increased shipping, there's a lot of concerns, especially for marine wildlife, uh, and because the Inuit community heavily depends on them. But what my project is focusing on is not on this map. It's actually the lakes that are scattered around the Arctic. And lakes are important because they provide a source for drinking water, and they provide critical uh, spawning habitat for Arctic char, which is very important for the Inuit diet. So this led me to ask two questions. First one is, what are the critical loads of Arctic lakes? And under present and future predictions, uh, do they exceed their critical loads? I'm going to do this. Oh, these are my objectives, which is first, to assess the water chemistry of Arctic lakes. Second, calculate critical loads. And third, determine their exceedances. And for this presentation, I'll be focusing on the first question, which is what are critical loads of Arctic lakes? So what are critical loads? So first, we got to understand acid neutralization capacity, which is the measurement of the buffering capacity against acidification. And this is done through water chemistry. I know, there are lots of equations and whatnot. But it's mainly, in general, uh, the acid neutralization capacity is the sum of cations and the anions. And we can think of this as the good guys and the bad guys. So if you have a lake with higher buffering capacity, you have a lot of good guys that are able to neutralize the bad guys, which is excess anions that cause acidification. So back to critical loads. Critical loads is the maximum, estimated maximum amount of acid deposition that a region can receive damage without its effect. So it's basically like a threshold amount. And a good example is drinking. Everybody here has a certain threshold in terms of alcohol consumption. So for me, I'm a small guy, I can't handle my liquor. Well, some other people can. So ecosystems with larger critical loads can handle more acid deposition than ecosystems with lower critical loads. Another important uh, concept is exceedances. And exceedances is where regions have a higher risk of acidification and is where acid deposition is larger than critical loads. And using our example of alcohol consumption, we all know what exceeding our alcohol consumption <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, concept of critical loads is largely used in Europe, especially within their long-range transboundary air pollution convention, which is made up of a bunch of protocols that aim to reduce air pollution especially those that are responsible for acidification, eutrophication, and ground level ozone. And in Canada, we somewhat have something similar with our neighbors to itself, or for now. Um, but this <laughs> agreement <laughs> aims to reduce transboundary air pollution, which causes acidification. And this has been done over 20 years. So back to our question of what are the critical loads of uh, Arctic lakes and ponds. So the method is, I'm going to use water chemistry from lake surveys and uh, water chemistry database. And the water chemistry is being used in, to calculate critical loads through the SSWC. The SSWC is the steady state water chemistry model. And it's based on the principle that acid deposition should, for this case, from shipping, should not exceed the input of base cations, as you can see, coming from the erosion of the geology, or surrounding geology, plus the required buffering capacity to protect biota. 
And the species I want to protect is Arctic char. So, uh, for example, the skeletons are coming in, so you should have enough bodyguards to, to defend the skeletons, plus enough to defend the king. <laughs> so that's the set of state water chemistry model. So back to the method. So we have our water chemistry, we have our critical loads calculation through the steady state water chemistry model, and we have our Arctic char that we're trying to protect, and we have exceedances. So exceedances come from uh, Environment Canada, they have model deposition with and without shipping, that's the wham nam with Arctic Marine and not no Arctic Marine, wham nam. And for the years 2010 and 2030. So the Arctic database. Uh, the Arctic database was primarily made out of data from the literature, and in this database there are 1,271 sites, as you can see here, all across the Arctic. And each different uh, color represents a different author. So over 30 papers have been merged into one gigantic database. Now for the study sites, the lake surveys, samples were collected at Kimmerer. Oh yeah, and there's a, uh, here we are in Kalapala, just to show how far it is. So in Kimmerer, in Kalapala, uh, here's a map of the study site around Kalapala. And in Pangertong, uh, here are the sites. And a shout out to Scott there in the nice yellow orange sweater <laughs> for collecting samples on Colt and Prince Charles Island. And thanks to Peter Flair's lab for collecting samples in Northwest Territories as well. So at each lake, uh, two, uh, 250 milliliter bottle, or 170, I give to you, were uh, used to collect surface water. And a GPS was used to record the location and elevation at each site. Each site. So some results. Uh, out of the 1,271 sites, uh, only 1,083 sites had enough data or water chemistry to actually calculate critical loads. And out of that, approximately 81%, uh, as you can see in the here, is classified as very sensitive to acid deposition. Well, only 4% were classified as very insensitive to acidification. So if we put that on the map, we can see that around the center, uh, central Arctic, we have lakes that are very sensitive to acid deposition. And those with, uh, that are insensitive are located on the Yukon, Ellesmere Island, Southampton Island. And as a scientist, we all love box plots. So we decided to make the box plot. And we can see the majority of the sites in the Arctic are within the, the red band, which signifies the sensitive, being very sensitive. And there's three, Ellesmere Island, Southampton Island, and Yukon, that are classified as insensitive. So why is that? So if we look at the water chemistry, we can see that the uh, three regions have more alkaline or less acidic lakes than the rest of the Arctic. And we can see that conductivity is also higher among those three regions than the rest of the Arctic. And that's associated with a lot of cations or a lot of good guys floating around in the water. We can also see that for calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. And the main reason for that is, I think it's a geological influence. So we see here, a lot of the sites classified as very sensitive are located on sensitive geology, such as the Precambrian Shield. And the Precambrian Shield is mostly comprised of quartz, which has a hardness of seven. Uh, I'll get that to you later. And sites that are located, uh, sites that are in insensitive to acid deposition are primarily located on the blue, which is mostly sedimentary rocks that are kind of like limestone or sandstone. So those are mostly uh, comprised of uh, materials such as calcite and gypsum. And if we look at the hardiness scale, if you have lakes on bedrock that are really hard, it erodes less. So you have less cations going into your lakes as opposed to lakes that are on limestone, for example, that are very brittle. So when you have erosion going on, you have more cations or the good guys going into your lake. So you have a better buffering capacity against acidity. And other studies have done, or other studies in terms of critical loads of lakes, have also kind of show what we're talking about here. So we have lakes that are situated on shield, all have really low critical loads as opposed to those that are situated on limestone, 
for who have really high or higher uh, critical loads. But one thing that gets me is Ellesmere Island. And Ellesmere Island is located way at the top of the Canyon Arch. Uh, alert here is probably closer to the North Pole than civilization. So that's pretty far away. And what I, I'm thinking is uh, a lot of these sites are situated along this band. And this band is, uh, one way to call it, is the high Arctic oasis. And this is situated in a valley that's self-facing. So in the summertime when the Arctic has 24-hour daylight, it creates this microclimate that is warmer and more, uh, more, more warmer than the surrounding landscape. And it creates an ideal uh, environment for vegetation to grow. So you have a more developed uh, vegetation and more developed catchment in that area. And that creates a microclimate with evapotranspiration that enhances the erosion that's going on. And as you may remember, Ellesmere Island is located on sedimentary rocks, so if you have more erosion of uh, geology that has a lot of cations, then you have additional buffering capacity from the additional flux of cations. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was not able to get uh, sulfur deposition models from Environment Canada. They're still running it, so here's an error. <laughs> so how do they compare to other studies? Not a lot of studies have done critical loads of Arctic lakes, but I found one report by the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program that showed this data of the acid neutralization capacity of lakes in the Canadian Arctic. And it kind of shows similar trends to what I depicted here, where lakes located on the Western Arctic, situated on sedimentary rocks, uh, tend to have higher acid neutralizing shape, neutralization capacity than those situations situated in the Eastern Arctic, uh, such as Baffin Island, of course, are more on granite limestone, uh, granite geology, as, with the exception of South Mountain Island. So to bring it back to shipping, uh, as here I've shown the two major shipping routes, and we can see lakes that are situated near the shipping routes are more sensitive to acid deposition than those away from it. So when it comes to policy, I think when there is policy regarding uh, emission control in the Arctic, I think they should focus to those situated adjacent to the shipping routes and those away from the shipping routes. And that's one thing that I hope my research would do, is that it would help the International Maritime Organization establish a uh, emission control area in the Arctic, as we have two of them here. And within these areas, it's actually a oops, 200 nautical mile zone that aims to reduce the emissions of sulfur oxides nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. Uh, Sox and nox are responsible for acidification, or particulate matter is, uh, can affect human health. So within these uh, emissions control zones, they need to, uh, ships entering these zones must have a fuel content, a sulfur fuel content of less than 0.1%. So hopefully that'll work out. And I think that's it. So thank you to all these organizations for funding and for logistics support. Julian, my supervisor, uh, Peter, and Celine as my community member, uh, Pedro for helping out with field work, and I guess Scott, you're kind of in there, so it works out. So thank you very much. Does the uh, freezing over the lakes in a colder point, assuming that it still does, <laughs> especially with the way that, that the climate changing, that, will that affect the uh, ability for the lakes to uh, uh, react to uh, the pollution that may come into lakes or there, there is um, I, I can't if I'm getting a question correct does the freezing over affect yeah. uh, what you can or what counts enter yes. the system so that one's a very interesting question because a lot of these samples are collected during summer just for logistic purposes but during the springtime when we have this gigantic melt it actually dilutes the lake so it becomes more, even more sensitive to acid deposition. But I don't know if uh, incoming emissions do like build up in the snow layer, and then in the springtime it all melts. It might, but there is uh, I do I do read some articles that that do state that during the springtime when there's an influx of fresh water, it does dilute and it becomes more prone to acidification. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, sorry.
Sample the, the surface water because I don't have a boat. Um, so, well, it is a valid question. Um, and I can't swim, so I don't know how. I don't know how the university would like it. It was like, oh, I'll just send this guy to sample water alone in the Arctic or something. Um, but uh, interesting question. I think um, we sample the surface because uh, that's where the when deposition comes in from the atmosphere. That's going to be the first. Uh, layer of water that's going to be affected by the okay. definition, so we want to make sure it's that. An interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to put like an actual puking because this thing's being recorded. So <laughs> people are like, like, oh my god, imagine environmental can looking at this now. Like, Cut your funding out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that could be your master's right there. But I'm already getting a master's. Oh, uh, potential PhD then. <laughs> uh, uh, personally, I don't know, but I do understand that erosion is a big deal, and a lot of research is going into that. But it would be interesting to see how that uh, impacts the flux of cations coming in. But uh, I think on that mountain, because it's situated on Picking and Shield, there's not a whole lot of soil. I mean, there's like maybe a centimeter or so, maybe more. <laughs> but there's not like a whole like, 10 feet of permafrost that's going to melt. Oh, that's road. Yeah, on that. But uh, like I said, most of the Arctic is situated on limestone, so that could, yeah, maybe Scott has on that. He's been on more. Other but there's definitely more soil than that. Yeah. But there would be yeah. Yeah. You can take yeah. We were taking several seconds this much. Here's your rock. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. yeah. I guess just uh, also, um, does do the, does any of the um, deposition from the uh, change in the pH uh, does it actually deposit within the uh, lake bed itself? Do you actually see a difference over time if you were to force it? Like a paleo? Like. Uh, Oh, like I guess more of a long term. Right. Say, I'm not too sure, sure for sulfate because uh, you could. Uh, I'm not sure of that question, but um, I'm pretty sure you could do it with heavy metals that are settled out into the sediment. But that is a good question. Um, but I'm not too sure with sulfate and nitrates because uh, once they enter the system, they kind of get used up, like the sulf. Well, sulfate bacteria that uses it to make mer methyl mercury, so that could be one. But uh, I don't think you could uh, dig deep down and see like, oh, deposition sulfate deposition was this much back in the day. Uh, I'm not too sure. But... Oh, you guys are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Wait, do you think that uh, Arctic char is an indicator species? Are you just using like a Looking at the, the population numbers, or are you looking at? Uh, no, I'm using. Uh, so, uh, acidification has long been studied in Scandinavia, and the numbers that I use for our Arctic char is actually from that study where they surveyed like thousands of lakes in Scandinavia, so Sweden, Finland, and Norway, uh, and they looked at the relationship between damaged populations of Arctic char and pH and sulfate concentration in lakes. So that's how they drift the uh, model, or the curve used uh, for Arctic char. So the number that I'm using is 20 or 11 milliequivalents per liter, and that's used to protect 95% uh, of an Arctic char population. Um, in terms of the emission control zones or uh, I'm not sure if I have that name right, but how do the ships coming through reduce their sulfur whatever they're not like the matter just taking less trips through or burning oh so they have to use like I guess more uh, clean fuel yeah clean fuel <laughs> we'll say clean fuel uh, you could use that but also you could also add scrubbers to your chimney thing <laughs> what's it called 
Filter it. Filter it. Filter it. So filter it. Yeah, you can add scrubbers. So that's another way. That, but um, so when you enter the Northwest Passage or any place in the Canadian Arms, you have to register with the Coast Guard, and that data has your engine type, what fuel you're using, and stuff like that. So that's how they enforce it. Yeah. Or they can hire students to just take samples. <laughs> Yeah. I have a question that's not really related. Um, how do they get fuel up there when they're going through? Uh, these are for like cargo ships, so they emission. They control. have all the fuel. Yeah, okay. or they go into ports, but I don't think Canada has a deep port yet. And then you have to get fuel to the port, and a lot of the things that they're flying are so. Yeah. So, uh, so for shipping, I think they have enough fuel to go across the North Best Passage. Hopefully, or else you're a really bad like ship captain. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but like, if you're curious about how fuel gets up for like communities that run diesel generators, there's a ship that goes to communities like once a year and deposits like a million barrels of fuel. 